Hey, it's Greg. This is the Square Pizza Pod, cooked up by Shermco. Miss Nicole Yarbo, so great to have you back on the podcast. What's up? Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and you're gonna you're gonna send me a link so I can send this to my mom, so she can watch live, and then we're gonna uh, if jump mom into. Mom is watching. It. Yeah, if mom is watching, then we've done something right. Um, yep, yes, you're about yep. to get all, all the links in a minute. Uh, how are you? It's good to see you. <laughs> um, I am good. I'm real. I'm really great. I'm really great. Uh, you and I got to catch up uh, briefly before this started and went live. Um, I'm back in the Ed nonprofit game, back in the mix, and uh, it's it's very fun. It's it's just really cool to be around like so many brilliant people who care about something. Um, you know, I try to surround myself with those people, but I've been energized for the past like two months. That's great. That's yeah. better than I think what most, most adults can say. Um, we'll definitely get into that. I dropped the link in the comment chat or in the comment section. So you should be able to pull it in the cold and anybody else who's watching us should be able to pull All it right. as well to share it. Cool. Um, yeah, nice. I think a few things for our listening audience, right? So like, obviously you Everybody knows Nicole Yarbo. She's world famous. Uh, part, <laughs> one. part two is that she's one of the few guests to jump back on the podcast, which I don't know if that says something about me, the host, or just our <laughs> guest. But nonetheless, we're happy she's here. Uh, but for those keeping track at home, she joined back. We, this is also kind of crazy. It was almost a year ago to the day, two years ago, when you were on the podcast the first time chatting oh, about really? good best other things yeah so it's like almost it's our this is great it's our two-year anniversary and then you have another oh my gosh yeah but that's not for a while don't okay. don't like uh take the shine away from our two-year anniversary uh <laughs> that's that's in june it's totally fine uh that's so funny i think i knew that but um yeah i was like oh march march uh time just like yeah. flies by so fast I know. yeah that's crazy um, now we can talk about all of the disastrous things of, that have happened since we were last here together. And all the things that we will fix. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you, uh, you're you in Oakland today, right? How are things going in Oakland? Uh, things are going great in Oakland. The sun is shining. That's all I really like want these days of my life is the sun shining. And, um, you know, did I get some sleep? And is someone yelling at me? You know, I, I don't actually like the yelling part. Is someone not yelling at me? So if all those things are happening, I feel like things are, they're solid, really solid. Uh, sometimes when people ask, I tell them that like, I, we made payroll last month. It looks like we're going to make payroll this month and I have food in the fridge. And it's like, check one, check yeah. two, check three, everything else is gravy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm like really excited good. to have this conversation too, just because, you know, coming back into the space and obviously some folks might not know me, um, but coming back into the space is just like, it's a serious homecoming. Um, and it's mm. not just like, it's not just, you know, that person that you knew, you're in the same place, you smell the same smells. Um, it, it's helped me actually kind of re-engage with, I think, who I am and like what's important to me. And so I'm still like riding that, riding that wave right now. Um, so let's not mess it up. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. I'll do my best. Um, yes, it is very good to have you back for a number of reasons. Uh, we were on like a really fun California string. So we had um, Ali Medina recently from Oakland, the Oakland Public Education Fund, which maybe you know. Uh, which I do. I'm sure you do. Yeah, we had um, Irene Shi recently from the Bay Area and My Matters Bay, and now you. So we're uh, we're gonna need to open a West Coast uh, Square Pizza studio here soon, so we can be more accessible to the people in. Uh, as long as I can in, creep around uh, it, I'm fine. Yeah, but yeah, really, really phenomenal women. It was really cool to kind of listen to the podcast because I've been following both of their work for some time. Um, oh, cool. But yeah, Oakland is full of great people. I'm I'm pro Oakland for sure. Yeah, which we knew. Well, I and think yeah, uh, Irene is it Irene? She's in uh, yep. San Mateo, which I feel That's like right. is close enough. Close enough. 
yeah. for uh, for a non geography major and a person that doesn't live in California. Yeah, that sounds right. I'll I'll, I'll assume what you're saying is accurate. Perfect. Um, all right, I know, I know we're just going to spend a lot of time on kind of um, current passion project and the work you're leading, and I think the work and the leader. I think perhaps you're trying to find for. Um, 4.0, but I, you know, but before that, I think last time we chatted with you, we learned so much about the fundraising work. You were doing a good bets, and then you kind of transitioned and launched your own thing, which is Boost. I know you've been really like vulnerable and honest, which I think is really great from a, a business owner perspective, an entrepreneur perspective. Which I think in my when maybe in my perspective, sometimes those things are over romanticized for um, right or wrong reasons. But yeah, no, I'd love like whatever you're comfortable, just kind of share people. You know, from good bets to boost to here, um, kind of what you've been working on, yeah, um, and kind of what you learned from the boost experience. Um, well, I'll give like a little bit of context into who I am and um, in terms of what I've done or spent my like professional time doing. You know, yeah, I started please. out teaching. Um, I, I first started out my education career as a lecturer at UC Berkeley, which is incredibly random to be like a 22 or 23 year old trying to get um, 20 year olds to stop talking while you're talking. So yeah, I've constantly just been bullied as a teacher, but uh, I started that. And then, you know, I really wanted to get on the ground. I was in grad school and a lot of folks were like, Hey, your head's in the clouds. Like you have all these ideas, but you don't have any, you don't, you don't know what it's like at all to, to actually, you know, do this work. Um, and so, you know, don't threaten me with a good time. I decided to go to probably the hardest place um, I could go to with the hardest placement. So I went to New Orleans, Louisiana, obviously post Katrina um, through Teach for America, and I taught uh, special education. And so, you know, that's just such a, a trip. I, I want to be brief for the sake of time, but I would say that that really shaped kind of what I thought was possible, um, not just for for people in general, but just for myself. And so I think I was kind of, um, you know, starting my professional career, had this little like entrepreneurial like desire in me. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I didn't know anyone who had started a business at that point, but uh, this sort of spark was starting to, to develop um, in me. And so uh, I was in New Orleans. I got uh, a chance to be part of this really cool uh, educational um, entrepreneurship community called 4.0, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, but I just met a lot of really cool misfits. A lot of them were teachers. Some of them were developers. You know, some of them were doing different things in the city, uh, but we're all brought together by this desire to make education better. And so I mm -hmm. um, met a ton of people, expanded my horizons, um, really started to identify as a founder. And so I went and taught high school after that. And so I, I helped found a, a high school in New Orleans. Um, again, this like spark of entrepreneurial energy. And even though we don't consider maybe a, a founding teacher at a, a high school, you know, an entrepreneur, I think we should. I think we should start thinking a little bit differently about folks who are um, courageous enough or stupid enough, depending on um, when and where you ask them. To, to try something new, to push their own limits in service of doing something much bigger, right? So um, I, I think that's kind of where a lot of that started for me. And I just got really curious about everything. Um, after being in 4.0, I realized that a lot of the challenges that actual entrepreneurs were facing were around funding. And so I mm. ended up uh, moving to DC and working as a philanthropic advisor uh, with folks where I was really focused on helping them learn about the educational innovation landscape, the reform landscape, uh, workforce development, uh, economic sort of opportunity. So these different areas. And I really get to talk to people who, you know, themselves were incredibly wealthy, like richer than you could probably ever imagine. I was telling a friend the other day, my first assignment there was to memorize the 400 richest families in America. And so to just get a sense of how, you yeah. know, I had to orient myself and um, yeah, it was it was also really, really cool because that was another moment where I started to actually learn more about business, like from directly from people who had built these sort of, um, you know, amazing businesses and, and um, were able to have such an impact commercially who also wanted to give back. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've I've been like really lucky that I've got to operate in this like giving back and 
trying to do well for yourself um, kind of duality that sort of makes me who I am. Um, yeah, then ended up leaving that because it was uh, cool for a lot of reasons, but also torture. So I <laughs> left and then went back to the entrepreneur side, worked at some charter schools, um, did some fundraising, and then uh, started Good Bets. And so this is the point um, in our relationship in which we've met, like our origin story. Um, I started Good Bets, which um, grew into basically a consulting, a little consulting practice that um, was helping people who wanted to build really ambitious projects, but from the get-go in their DNA, have them fundable mm -hmm. or sustainable, right? And so I had this really unique experience where I actually worked with donors and kind of knew what they wanted and potentially had empathy for them and their billions of dollars. Um, but I was able to kind seems of like a very uh, intentionally <laughs> used word there, uh, but, but it, dep but, it depends. Know. It depends. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have met some of the coolest billionaires ever and um, some of the not as cool billionaires, but you remember there's a filter because all of the people I met actually wanted to, you know, give money back. Some bias. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, there was a bit of a filter, but uh, you know, you still meet all kinds, but yeah, I was super thankful for that experience because I didn't know at the time that it was giving me this really rich, um, uh, perspective on how to, how to help people who looked like me, who, you know, maybe were also like a little rough around the edges, how to help them better communicate what they were building with these people. And so, um, good bets, you know, the name actually came from, uh, the work I was, was doing with philanthropists where they would do this thing where they called everything a bet. Mm. And I, I oh. thought it was so weird. Um, but I'm like, Oh, this is how they see this. Like oh, it's all, it's all a like gamble. Um, and so I was like, well, what if we could just, what if I could do something where the mission was essentially to help people, you know, um, become a better bet. Um, mm. Better bet is like not cute. So we went with good bets. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, it was such a cool experience because I got to learn about um, how to build what people needed um, yeah. and how to make sure that they could kind of see their dreams come to fruition in a way. And um, we got to work with um, really cool, interesting places, uh, lots of charter schools, um, lots of interesting nonprofits and projects, a bunch of for-profits from like global, like, you know, uh, skincare brands to, you know, a uh, hair cutting nonprofit with like a, a budget of, you know, 10 grand. And so, yeah. um, it was probably actually one of the most uh, rewarding things I've had in my life. This is weird to reflect on, but yeah. Uh, and then we met actually, I think we just jammed on this. Yep. We I'll let you take that story on because now we're approaching the beginning and I'll, I'll talk about boost and the present in a second, but yeah. Where did we meet Greg? How did this happen? I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> I think the, the two leading candidates are either a TFA alum conference in Phoenix, a social entrepreneurship conference that TFA used to put on. I don't think it does any longer. I think you probably like were the keynote speaker one year and they were like, this is the best we're going to get and then wrapped it up <laughs> after that year. Um, so that's, that's option one and or option two is that I think you and I are both alums of 4.0, which we'll talk about. And I did a, a short kind of weekend sprint program there a few years, many years ago now at this point, almost 10 years already. Don't tell anybody. Uh, and a world in which we met there as well. Yep. Yep. That's so funny. They're like, uh, Jarbo, you can speak. Um, and then we're going to cancel this conference. <laughs> we're never going to have it again. Um, you realize so, we're only going to go downhill after yeah. Jarbo speaks. So let's wrap it. Let's go out on a high. I was thinking of it the other way, but I guess like because I'm a guest, you're not allowed to make fun of me. So I'll bring my own self-deprecating uh, <laughs> comments to this. Better if you lead with that so then I can figure out where to jump yep. in the other way. Yeah. He's a cool guy, everyone. Don't worry. Um, yeah. So yeah, that conference is really great. I mean, and this is actually a really great segue into 4.0, but I will stop because people asked about Boost and then people want to know what it feels like to fail uh, publicly. So I'll do a little stint there and talk about Please. more interesting things. Um, oh, no, yeah, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, so, you know, I, I put out this uh, this LinkedIn post 
uh, I don't know, last month maybe. Um, and you know, I wrote that in like five minutes mm. and <laughs> I had to, I, I needed to announce actually, this is like the behind the scenes story, I guess, of this post. Um, but I, I needed to kind of announce to my professional network that I was, uh, transitioning so I could, um, transitioning to like the interim CEO role, uh, or from boost. So people kind of didn't think there was overlap there and, you know, wanted to make sure that people kind of understood what was happening. And so I just wrote up this post like very quickly. I sent it to a friend of mine, texted and was like, Hey, does this like look fine? Are there any spelling errors? And he's like, yeah, sounds great. Like I love it. And he's this broy dude who like played football at university of Miami. And I'm like, did you even read it? Um, but I, I posted it and it got such a reaction. And I think what I was trying to do in the yeah. post is um, one, tell the truth, um, you know, and the truth was I had this really cool opportunity to start a venture back fintech company, uh, which was really important to me. We did the whole venture thing. So we raised money. You know, I think at the time when I was raising money, I was one of a hundred black women to ever raise more than a million dollars in venture capital. And I remember going to, yes. thank you. I spent all of it. Yes. <laughs> it's all gone. Also, um, I mean, better than not spending. That's what you're raising that's for. True, spending, that's right? true. That's true. And I have, I have some spending stories on that. But um, one of the, yeah, I went to DC actually to visit a friend who I played soccer with at Cal, um, who's now yep. some big shot lawyer. And, and we went out to brunch and, you know, I told her, I told her this. Um, and she was like, oh, you mean a hundred black women like this year? And I remember being like, no catchy. I mean, like ever. ever and I, ever. Uh, yeah, ever. I just like <laughs> putting a point on that is very funny, like to me now, because it, it's just a good reminder of like how far we have to go. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, so I did that. Uh, we, we ended up raising, you know, uh, more than that. And um trying to make something work for Gen Z aged people really was a market who, you know, had to manage more than one way to make money. And a lot yeah. of that came from my time at Good Bets where I was, you know, starting this thing with all these different clients. But unlike you, I went the route of a little bit more of like a solo, um, a solo entrepreneur didn't hire like a huge team. And so structurally there's just like a lot of questions about how to do this yourself and like how do you manage these different streams of income um how do you monetize something that makes you happy and fit it into your life and um your financial plans and so that was something for me that um you know i really struggled with and was new for me i was enjoying the work that i was doing but I just mm -hmm. had a really hard time putting into context and this sort of larger context and financial plan for my life. And so that was really something I wanted to explore. And at the same time, and this is still happening, um, so many young people and not just like young people, but I would say Americans, um, cause that's a context I know the best, but so many Americans, like, of course they're living paycheck to paycheck, which obviously doesn't feel good, but I think there's, some sort of silver lining for some folks who maybe are oriented um, like more like me, which is, well, if I need to make more money, how can I do that? How can I leverage my skills? How can I um, make a difference in a way that would allow me to more easily pay my rent, right? Okay. And so kind of seeing this like rise in, in side hustling, um, technology is like a massive, you know, tailwind for that as well. And so um, it just was an infinitely interesting problem to me. Like, how do you sure. help young people better manage their money, better make their money? And it just feels smarter about their money when um, it feels like such a transient thing that's like out of your control. Mm -hmm. And so that was the thing that we were just kind of jamming on and uh, boost. And, and then towards the end of the work, we went more towards debt. Um, and that was kind of following the signs of the market a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our consumer debt is out of control, sort of highest levels that it's it's ever been um, across everything, um, yeah. autos, uh, credit cards, et cetera. And so wanted to do that. And then simultaneously, uh, folks might know that last October, people had to start paying student loans again. And we had worked with this population who basically got out of college, knew they had student loans, but had never paid one. And so you know, for years because of forbearance and COVID yep. stuff, et cetera, they had 
uh, no sort of context into that. And so, you know, we tried to make the quick pivot with very little cash in the bank. And, um, you know, I think I read this in the post that at the end, we just didn't have any gas in the tank. And so like, mm -hmm. that's like the nice, like cute story. And I think the real story, um, that is real, but I think yeah, the story, um, I think the story that you don't often hear for some reason, because people don't want to talk about it is like, I really wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't ready to do everything that, uh, was required of me for many reasons. And the biggest one is like, I didn't know, right. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. Yep. And, uh, the biggest lessons I think I've really learned are people matter a lot and not just who you hire, um, who you take money from, mm -hmm. who you partner with, who you look up to, um, who you surround in your personal life. I mean, people talk about this, but entrepreneurship in that way, particularly venture backed uh, stuff. And so for folks who don't um, know sort of the venture backed world, you're essentially getting money and your job as a founder and, and never forget this. I did not know this and I learned pretty quickly, um, but too late that your job is really to get returns for your investors. Yeah. Um, you, have, that you, is you have a number really of losses it. now based upon the number of people that have funded you, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, the markup, like they, they want markups. And so yeah. um, markups for folks, basically say someone says my company is worth a million dollars and they they buy a portion of it or rights to buy a portion of it. Um, they want to see that company become 10 million, become 100 million, become a billion, right? And so they operate in this, this sort of power law and economies of scale things, which um, are really cool and fascinating, but I, I entered the space thinking that um, I could find a way to preserve my like personal mission and interests um, mm -hmm. and sort of satiate the, the desire or like my true responsibility as someone who was there to return capital to my investors. And I will say that, can you do both? I think so. And now I'm more certain that you can because I've been in the, the situation but I was not ready to do both. I did not know what it required, which meant that I, I had a really hard time <laughs> trying to make it happen. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when I say I'm not ready, uh, what it looked like day to day was I screwed up constantly. Mm. Um, I had well, a welcome, really- Welcome back to the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I screwed up constantly um, with all kinds of things, hiring people, making decisions, um, uh, partnering with people, um, you know, you learn so much about yourself. I, I told somebody it's like the most expensive professional development I've ever had. Mm. Uh, and it's like the most valuable, um, you know, in some ways you have people's livelihoods in your hands. And when you take a swing, like you better not miss. Um, and that's something that, uh, yeah, that that's really hard to deal with. And so I'll give like a very specific context to to some of this sure we had gone i think that like my people might trace this back i'm going to be like very high level here just because i i think it's really hard i i think it's hard to be an investor some days and you know it's yep. definitely hard to be a founder so i don't want i don't want anyone to think i'm like picking on folks um but there was this moment where we probably had like six months of capital left and um a huge, basically these people I needed on the team, engineering team decided to like quit like that week. We had a little bit of, we, we didn't even have six months in the bank. We, we had like, I think we had like $30,000 mm -hmm. or something in the bank, which is not a lot uh, yeah. <laughs> for it's people. For uh, it yeah. can't, you can't make payroll. Um, and uh, I, someone basically just like quit on slack and someone we really really needed and then you know there was a little bit of like a domino effect and no one they quit on slack and i'm like on the west coast so everybody saw it before me and um i guess like no one said anything it's like a slack message that like no one's putting like an emoji on yeah you know waiting, waiting and to I, see the boss's reaction and we were like a week from like, I think a week or two weeks or something from launching this like new thing. 
that was like, I was so certain this was like the thing that was going to get us back in the game. And, you know, we'd be able to, to, um, to all of this would have just been like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, that was terrible. <laughs> so, you know, just like going into this moment where it's already tough, you're already like, you're sitting there convincing folks that this stuff can happen constantly, mm -hmm. but then you're looking at your bank account and you're, you're like, you know, it's very, uh, it, it's emotional. It's like kind of yeah. hard to deal with. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I ended up, uh, this goes back to the people thing. I ended up calling a friend who helped me build the initial version, um, who's incredible. And I was like, Hey, here's what happened. So I had my sad moment and then I was like, boom, get it, get out of, get out of there, get out of mm -hmm. there. You can't do that because you're promising, making all these promises to people. Um, and that would have been a time where I think most people would have just been like, you know what? It's done. We're done. We're not going to do this anymore. Um, yeah. But I was like, look, we're going to keep going. We're going to do something slightly different. We're going to like pivot. We're going to make sure everybody is, you know, on the bus with us and get things going. And um, we're going to swing. Mm -hmm. And I think I knew at that time, you could kind of see in the future. I was like, okay, well, I think we can, I can get us like six months of this going. Cool. Um, and I, I did that. And so I was like, this is like a six month bet. And um, yeah, there's a moment that I would go back and say like, maybe I should just ended it there. Like maybe that should have been it. Um, but like I said, I think you recognize uh, that it's your decision. You can yeah. swing. Um, but like I said, like if you swing, don't miss. And, um, I, I missed, and I think that was, there were all these sort of rippling effects afterwards that I think did a massive number on like my, my psyche, mm. um, my, and all kinds of like tangible things in my life and like relationships. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, those are the parts I think that people don't talk about. Yeah. Right. Um, and there's a lot of moments like that, but you know, I think it was a good experience. Uh, I would maybe do it again, uh, but do it differently. But yeah. So for all the people who want to know what it, was, it was like, I mean, uh, I made a lot of mistakes and, um, but it was a cool experience. I will not make any of those again, but I, I think the reality is, is that, um, we can better prepare people for that kind of opportunity. And actually it's a great segue into 4.0 because the, the truth is like, we have to, better yeah. prepare people um, to, to build things that don't exist. And who not, you know, then in a better position than you to do that from both like your passions and your skill sets, but also the most recent experience. Right. And yeah, I want to go to 4.0, but I, I would just yeah. say thanks for, for your vulnerability and your honesty. Right. I would say um, obviously not common in this space in entrepreneurship yeah. and in business owners, as you mentioned. So kudos for you for doing that. Um, I'll be semi vulnerable back to you. And like, so part of my team uh, feedback from our last team retreat was they wanted me to be more vulnerable, mm -hmm. less around like business stuff and more around personal stuff. Um, so I think that was interesting to me and also something I'm working through to try to be a better leader for my team as well. Um, but I think for your ability to do that, your willingness to do it, it is incredible from afar. And so again, kudos. But then also, as, as you've said to Nicole, like it's not, fatal necessarily i know it's yeah. tough i'm not minimizing it but yeah. i think to your point you and i understand this when we say it is it was tough there are scars there will always be scars but you're obviously still physically standing or i guess maybe metaphorically standing currently sitting uh but probably could stand <laughs> if you wanted to and like still ready to fight another day and like now i have this yeah. cool opportunity at at 4.0 yeah i mean i appreciate that and what you just did is called mirroring so I was vulnerable and you got vulnerable back. But let mm -hmm. me tell you the secret. That post probably came six months after I had all my mental breakdowns. <laughs> so it was very cute and comforting that everyone was like, hey, you're going to be OK. Uh, and I was like, I'm OK, actually. Yeah. And so it was actually it's very cool to kind of be in that because you almost get to have both experiences at the same time. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and see how people kind of engage you. But yeah, I think this idea that you can be, these things can make you stronger and better mm -hmm. um, is something that we kind of say as a platitude, but like I'm stronger and I'm better. Yeah. 
Um, and that's, it's, it's a good thing to be reminded of. So thank yeah. you. It just hurts to get there sometimes, unfortunately. Um, <sighs> yeah. But, you know, now we're at this kind of this, this precipice, this next opportunity, both like, I think currently as a board member with 4.0 and then potential like interim CEO, not even potential, but actual interim CEO. And also I think <laughs> maybe for the search of the next CEO. Um, so yeah, yeah tell, tell the people that don't know just like what 4.0 is, and then we can go deeper onto like why it's such an yeah. exciting opportunity right now in our country. Well, I'll, I'll make, I'll make this brief. Um, it's funny in the notes. I mean, you probably saw this, you, Others have not seen this, but uh, I think I wrote, I'm happy because I get to talk about my two favorite things, <laughs> myself and 4.0, uh, and spend all of our time talking about myself. But yeah, so 4.0, that was the entrepreneurial organization and community I mentioned earlier in my story. And so similarly to, to Greg, I, I was able to, you know, encounter them over a decade ago and right. really change the trajectory of, of my life. And basically they're an education nonprofit, uh, used to be based in New Orleans. Now we're fully remote. Uh, and we sort of identify, invest in and upskill, you know, education entrepreneurs and leaders of, of the future of tomorrow. Um, and so we're always looking for the most empathetic, most ambitious people, um, most curious, like endlessly curious people um, who want to make education better and make learning better. And that happens in all kinds of ways. And so we help sort of mini incubate, I guess you could say, uh, different ideas that folks have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we provide through our programming, you know, four core C's that we talk about constantly, which is coaching, community, um, curriculum. Ah, there's something else, capital. Money, cash, important. Uh, so we we do all of that, and we have a little bit of a different model. We're not like a YC or <clears throat> uh, some of these bigger like incubators or accelerators. We give people a pretty tiny amount of cash, and actually, our, one of our our core fellowship is called the Tiny Fellowship. Okay. So, um, you know, we've given people it, it's range between five grand and ten grand to basically just test an idea and learn about design thinking learn about <clears throat> empathy, these sorts of things, and test the efficacy of their idea. So that's our core programming. We've worked with probably like 2,000 different alumni um, who are all over the place. Yep. And they're they're literally, they're just so legit. Yep. It's just hard to talk about. We have community uh, that has built, you know, massive, massive, like, you know, companies, massive school chains, and all ones that like have this sort of different twist that we care about a ton, which is, you know, you're building something that the community is truly invested in. They're building with you. And I don't have time to tell Matt Candler, the founder's uh, story, but, you know, I, I would say something that was really important to him. He helped uh, grow the KIPP network. Uh, yeah. He was their chief growth officer for a while, but one of um, one of the things I think I've learned from him and that he may have seen firsthand is the power of building when the community is right there with you. Yeah, building, building next with, not building, building. Exactly. For, right? yeah. And so I had never really heard of that. Um, I thought business product services were just something that some genius kind of, you know, threw together in their garage and like gave to people. But the reality was um, Matt and that core group of 4.0 and Hassan, you know, um, after Matt had really solidified this as part of like our ed innovation culture more broadly, yep. uh, is that the, the way to do this right is to do it with people. And you, I've just seen it over the last decade permeate into how funders talk about their work. You know, I was just doing this thing with um, New Profit, which is a huge intermediary social entrepreneurship funder um, in group. Austin. Yeah, we were, I was with them in Austin and, you know, they were talking about proximity and all these things. And I'm like, where did you hear about that? And so <laughs> 4.0 has a little bit of a casual way of, of talking about those issues. And then we let all the, you know, the management consultants can make them nice and pretty and, and put some chevrons on their decks. But uh, I, I think it was really, it's been really, really cool to see how much the, that initial sort of DNA um, has kind of made it into like the, yeah. the greater ideology of the space. Like if you try to do something to people in ed innovation right now, it's not happening. Um, yeah. It is not allowed. 
um, you will be canceled. Um, I don't think canceling is real, but uh, <laughs> some people do. So yeah, it's a it's a great org, and yeah, and we're looking for our next CEO. Yep. Um, and you know, I think what's important as someone who's been on the board and part of lots of different programming, and um, you know, the the organization is incredibly special. Um, I've talked to dozens of alumni in the past couple of months, and I talked to one yesterday who, you know, is now doing seven figures and massive state contracts with their with their work, um, and she was like. I would not be here without 4.0. It literally gave me the confidence to do this, the network of people I could go to and ask for help. Yep. Um, and it just, it cleared the path and it made it so I could pay rent for a couple of months and like really again, swing. Right. Yep. And I think the idea for the next generation of 4.0 is um, we really started with a fail fast mentality. Um, and I would love to see the organization as a board member go into what I was talking about earlier, which is a mentality where like you swing and don't miss. And it's mm -hmm. not that missing, like you'll be okay if you miss, but like, what if you didn't miss? Yeah. What if, like, what if you built something with the community and you took a shot and like you made it? What if you made it every time? Like, I'm just so excited about that future for the organization. And so, you know, we're looking for somebody who, um, they're they're okay with you know charting out a future vision and you know within that of course we want this sort of visionary person but like someone who's trustworthy and we know mm -hmm. will stand um in alignment with our values of building people up of hospitality um you know of community like those are the things that i think are are, are pretty critical um and you know the last thing i would say about this uh as i've gone back into the mix and hung out with a lot of my old funder friends. Um, I was asking them about, you know, I'll be honest, like the, the funding prospects in the future for our organization. Of course, yeah. And uh, always easier to ask at a happy hour, <laughs> I will say. But uh, I was like, just tell me the truth. Where are we? Just we just got the title of the podcast. There it is. Always <laughs> easier to ask at the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Happy uh, hour. And so... Um, you know, I heard pretty consistently, and I'll sum it up as 4.0 has a really distinct position in the ecosystem. And that uh, in this education ecosystem, and, and it's really here to, um, to bring new innovations to the space. Uh, and that I heard that over and over again. And it was really this line that like got to me. And it's just like, we're waiting for 4.0 to do something new. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that really hit me. And so I think when we're looking for this new person, um, they really have to believe that that is part of the value proposition of the organization, yep. that we're here to lead. Um, you know, when we started with some of these fellowships, I mean, you know, back then, we we're the only game in town. Sure. The, the, the only place saying, hey, you got an idea, it's good enough, try it, we'll help yep. you. Um, and, and now that's not the case and that's great, but it means that it's time for the organization to evolve well, um, yeah. and build, uh, you know, build something new. That's really cool. Yeah. I want to stick on the new part. I want to also offer maybe vulnerability, maybe not 4.0. Yeah. <laughs> is great. Um, in general, I was like, remember stalking them after school when I was teaching in Charlotte, like, man, this organization looks so cool. Like we don't have anything like this in Charlotte. I got to go for the fellowship a few years later just for that weekend. I was like, great. I'm just going to open this in Charlotte. I was like, we need one. There's money here. We're going to do this. And then after about five swings and misses, I was like, this shit's hard. Like, we're not, <laughs> not going to open this shit in Charlotte. Somebody should, but apparently I'm not the one to open it. Uh, so like been a long time admirer of like Matt and the crew. Um, and like all the work 4.0 was done. And I think, yeah, really cool that you are – kind of leading the charge, but also the organization is at this nexus point with where we are in 2024 with everything else happening around education. So I think with that context, yeah, I would love to know like what is new to you and also like what is exciting to you knowing that like you may be not be able to craft it. And so we might just yeah. be like sharing ideas right now, but what does, what does new 4.0 look like? New, what does new 4.0 look like? Um, all right, y'all, for all of you uh, applying, 
Yeah, uh, take notes, right? Tell you, tell you. <laughs> you hear this answers. in a third round interview. Like, oh shit, that's a good yeah. idea. I wonder um, how they thought about that. I think, uh, I think the organization needs to do a couple of things. I think one of the things it needs to do better um, that I'm excited about, and I get to do some of this work while I'm here for this short period of time, is to uh, tell these stories. Um, I. Uh, I just spoke with an alumni a little bit earlier today who said they were speaking to another alumni who also happened to be a very, very early funder mm -hmm. um, of the organization. And that this, this guy told her, um, you know, 4.0 doesn't make any lasting ventures. And uh, I was just like, how misinformed is that guy? Yeah, you know, say, well, yeah, I when you know, see like a, a rooted you see a rooted school that's, you know, yeah, started in New Orleans right. now is in Indy. I think they've got one in Nevada and then Vancouver, Washington, you know, working on one of the biggest cash transfer pilots for youth ever. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's a four point of venture. You see branching minds just close a, you know, a huge round of Bain capital. That's a four point of venture, you know, mm -hmm. America on tech that just got one and a half million dollars from new profit. That's a four point of venture. And I can keep going. Uh, Glean Education, which I was just talking about, uh, that, that Jessica had put together. I mean, they're doing statewide contracts. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars bringing new um, informed dyslexia training to educators that has never existed before. That's a four point of venture, right? Um, and I, I think I what I was social media campaign coming up uh, upon us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm just a LinkedIn poster. All right. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, I would like to see that and boost, even though it was in the fintech space. I mean, it was funded by Precursor Ventures, January Ventures, um, the House Fund at Berkeley. All of these, like boost is a 4.0 venture. Um, the, you know, we might not think about it the same way, but all the skills I learned here, the relationships I had, some of my first angel investors were 4.0 alumni. And so these stories, you know, are so important because I think, the, the future of 4.0 um, is really about telling a real story about cross-sector collaboration and how it's necessary for us to make education better. We need better board members. We need smarter superintendents. We for sure need smarter superintendents. Uh, we need smarter investors, funders, people who you know are ambitious, they're sophisticated, but they're kind. And, uh, you know, I think that's where I would like to see 4.0 on the sort of external side. And I think internally, you know, that's really going to be up to doing what they do best, which is listening to users, community. And I'd like to see the organization spend more time on the, this community I'm talking about and making sure they have the support, the social capital, and are continuing to build the social connective tissue that will allow all of us to, to thrive, yep. you know? So that sounds like a big job and uh, i'm excited to kind of see you know who's interested in this work because i can't think about anything that uh you know would would be more meaningful yep. than to see this organized and structured in a way that works and also like fun like we need more parties let's let's bring our parties back those, those were always a win what I know you're maybe naively optimistic like I am, and I think everything you said makes sense, but it only, I would argue, makes more sense if the funding community is willing to fund it. So I guess the question to you is like, with the right amount, with the right leader and the right amount of clarity, is the funding community ready and prepared to fund for, to continue to fund 4.0 and the next vision of it to continue to make it successful, in your opinion? Good question. We also need a fundraiser because that's in our FAQs. But I'm going to say yes. Okay. And I, I won't call myself naively optimistic here. Uh, okay. I think I'm pretty practical. Okay. Um, and me. something Excuse that's, me. yeah. Um, and, and something that's going on right now that's not talked about very much in, in our space, which I, I have a couple of theories why. Um, we're about to actually, you know, enter this period of time where we're going to see the largest wealth largest wealth transfer that we ever have. And so there's a world in which I was in philanthropy where there were lots of antique looking chairs and like, you know, meetings at the top of the Transamerica building. And, um, you know, this sort of culture of philanthropy that sort of harkens back to some of these initial days of American philanthropy, like the Carnegie's, um, you know, Ford's, Rockefeller's, et cetera, where people were giving for different reasons. I think that that 
that period of time is behind us mm. um, in the same way that I think that in ed reform and ed innovation, some of those initial leaders who brought us major charter networks or, you know, really big nonprofits and that have been around for decades, like it's, it's their time to retire, you know, respectfully, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not their time anymore. And so when I think about this next generation of philanthropists, they're in the 4.0 community. There are people who who had exits, they're now building their own foundations. There are people who, you know, are are itching to give back in a way that's smarter, more aligned with what they believe in, that they know has had an impact that they've, they've experienced themselves, sure. right? And so, again, I hope that new CEO can see that, leverage that. And um, I think that what's going to come along with this, and this is another place for 4.0 to do something new, is to truly model for people what it looks like to be supported by your community. How do you find sustainability with your community? How do you, you know, do true value exchange? Um, I think that's big work, but it's definitely not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, we have too many models outside of education of, of doing that. Like, let's bring it to ed. Like, you know, again, that would just be so fantastic. And I think the funding's there. And, um, you know, I think funders like peer pressure. I, I think when you look at for better you know, or worse it's it's usually like worse but i yep. think we can make it leverage yep. it into better um yeah people get bored people like novelty and 4.0 um has always been good at staying like right at the forefront of like the cultural changes that are happening for people mm -hmm. and educators in the space um and and this will it'll continue to be a place that people look for in education to see what the future looks like. And our new CEO um, is just gonna have to they're just gonna have to remember that and know that they they're coming into an organization with a major legacy, but with a ton of assets. I'm guessing they'll have some friendly board members remind them of that if they uh, get mis mis. Oh yeah, I love being on the board. I'm like, there call go, me, go but don't track. ask me to do anything. <laughs> Um, all right, Nicole, let's get you out of here on a few kind of rapid fire yep. questions and then maybe at a more practical level, uh, where should very talented, very interested, very smart, very diverse people apply for this role? Oh, I should have had that. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a, let's see, cause I'm at the computer. The O4 organization, um, is running this amazing, okay. amazing search firm. Um, can I like drop this here? I have to join the, oh, I have to connect. Um, I will just send this to you, uh, but yeah, please do. Yeah. So, um, it's on my LinkedIn, just like find, find us apply. If you want to talk about it, um, I'm happy to connect anybody, uh, with Regina who's running the search for us over there. Um, people can just email me at Nicole at four PTO.org and I will put them in the right place. Um, I also know you had notes. I'm just going off script here. I know you got to go, but like, oh, I'm here for you. There's an AI you. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I don't love it. I saw this, and I think respectfully, I was like, she's <laughs> gonna be bullish. She's gonna be bullish on this, but it's what I get. I was gonna be bullish it's on I get, AI. It's what I get for assuming, um, and also that we haven't chatted in a few years. So, but uh, I'm, I'm fairly grumpy about it too, and so this excites me even more that we're <laughs> talking about being grumpy about AI together. I I always have something to be grumpy about. Uh, I'm not grumpy. I'm just a little bit skeptical of it, and um, I, I would like to, you know, especially coming out like coming from like tech and kind of coming back into this. Um, I think what I learned in tech and like getting venture funded is that there are a lot of waves of like energy. And um, I think AI is really, really great for productivity. Cool. Um, I have questions about if it can help people sort of do the the core, um, you know, the core parts of learning, right? Like mm -hmm. if it can really stimulate creativity the way we want to give people like a better control of their own like cognition um, mm -hmm. across different levels and places. Um, and I think that the people who are going to help us figure that out are people who actually really uh, intimately involved in the technology. And so when I, I see folks being like, this makes things easier, and I'm kind of like, do you know how that works? Um, and do you know yeah. why it works? And so, you know, I have questions about that. And uh, I think I wrote you a message uh, on, on our notes. Like, I'm actually 
wanting to see people be more interested in in other areas where there are just new use cases being developed because the technology is truly, truly new. Mm -hmm. LLMs and all this stuff, it's not new, it's just more accessible. And Absolutely. right now they've been really great for productivity. Um, and that is that is amazing. Um, but I think what happens is that like we all, as like a species tend to like get better and smarter and elevate. And so I'm always looking at like kind of core technology that like allows students to do the stuff that we did with them um, in a way that's experiential, that actually speaks to what we know works about learning. Sure. And so one of the things I'm, I'm looking at a lot that I really like is spatial computing. Um, and so, you know, this is like Apple Vision Pro for people who don't know, uh, but it's just, this is like technology that pretty seamlessly brings the virtual world um, in connection with, with sort of like the physical world. And so you can kind of think minority report where you're, you know, going through your little computer screen, but you can kind of see the background of your living room in the same place. Yep. And uh, I'm much more interested in folks working on that stuff. There's this guy, Jonathan Teske, former meta guy running something called Reframe XR. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we should be looking at instead of these chat GPT wrappers, which is also fine if it helps you. Um, but I would like to see less productivity tools in education and more sort of hardcore, like, um, how do we rethink uh, the way that we engage with technology um, yeah. and make sure that, like, young people are engaging with the newest, best technology uh, that they can actually build upon on themselves. And, and right now, um, I'm not sure that's AI, but I do think it's great for productivity. And, you know, I use it sometimes. And, um I think it's great for literacy and differentiation and stuff like that. But yep. um, like, so are like flashcards for people. I don't know. Now I'm just riffing. I'm going to stop there. AI is good. It's not Nicole's favorite. I always thought, I appreciate you sharing that context is helpful. I always thought, and maybe still do think it like um, using XR or virtual reality or even VR as like a teacher training or teacher prep program, like, you know, I am a, a novice teacher. Nicole is is controlling this like virtual classroom I'm teaching. And then you choose like these two kids all of a sudden start falling asleep because I'm a boring teacher. And now I have to go like practice waking them up and re-engaging them. And then like you're monitoring it. All like real life scenarios that will happen to teachers. But think about the training cycles and the reps. I know you and I talked about kind of sports and practice and watching yeah. film last time. Well, you, you played football in college, right? Yeah, you can you can probably tell by <laughs> my. Well, you laughed a little too fast about how quickly <laughs> that was a little too fast to go. <laughs> that uh, was that was vulnerability. You did it, Greg. You did it. Yes, I played college football back in the day. That is correct. Yeah, it's still a uh, the still the peak of my life playing college soccer. It's like that's the best I'm ever gonna be at anything. Um, that's okay. We all, we all need to peak. We all need to get kicked off our pedestal. Um, you, you have some rapid fire ones for me. Yeah. I think last question before we jump, uh, what, what does square pizza remind you of? Um, okay. There's this new brewery. It's not new. Um, okay. cause there's one in San Francisco. I live in Oakland, which is four miles away for everybody. Um, uh, okay, a <laughs> place called stellar maker. It's like a brewery. Okay. And uh, they they have square pizza, and I think it's like it's Detroit style, right? So, some oh, people, are you yes. about to school me on this? Please do it. Some people uh, call Detroit pizza square pizza. It's technically true. I think the origin of the name was from like square, more rectangle cafeteria pizza that they served mm, yeah. back in the day, um, which is how the uh, name originated for the podcast but i think some people call detroit pizza square more like deeper dish situations uh but for being completely honest the thought was more cafeteria than square pizza mm. days i feel like i offended you <laughs> by saying that um but yeah there's this uh there's this brewery out here uh called cellar maker and it's what i order um but right. the the thing it really reminds me of is that place. What that place really reminds me of is um, Oakland is a place where um, it's just been really transient. And, you know, whenever I see a new 
you know, that brewery is like semi new. When I see a new place crop up, like a new business, I just get like really hopeful for the future of the city. Um, I, I really love the city and I want to see more of that. And so when I see sort of hipsterish and yuppie uh, things pop up, uh, you know, it's complicated, but uh, I do appreciate that, uh, you know, the city might be on an up and up. Sure. So to summarize, we're saying uh, bearish on AI, bullish on yuppie hipster establishments. And pizza that comes in a square. Always <laughs> bullish on pizza. Um, even better when it's a square. But it's yeah, perfect. hope for all. Hope for all. Nicole Jarbo, thanks so much for coming back uh, and joining the podcast. And uh, we'll certainly be kind of sharing, obviously, this episode, but also the opportunity to join and lead the incredible team at 4.0. And I um, appreciate you jumping on to share about the incredible work you're doing, the incredible work your organization is currently doing and the new work they'll be doing soon as well. Awesome, let's go. I love it. Thanks for folks who stuck around. Awesome, <laughs> thanks Nicole. Thanks so much for checking out Square Pizza Pod, making a few selfish requests. If you enjoyed the episode, Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps spread the word about the podcast and share this with a friend. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.